When Dunstan Cass turned his back on the cottage, Silas Marner was not more than a hundred yards away from it, plodding along from the village with a sack thrown round his shoulders as an overcoat, and with a horn lantern in his hand. His legs were weary, but his mind was at ease, free from the presentiment of change. The sense of security more frequently springs from habit than from conviction, and for this reason it often subsists after such a change in the conditions as might have been expected to suggest alarm. The lapse of time during which a given event has not happened is, in this logic of habit, constantly alleged as a reason why the event should never happen, even when the lapse of time is precisely the added condition which makes the event imminent. A man will tell you that he has worked in a mine for forty years, unhurt by accident, as a reason why he should apprehend no danger, though the roof is beginning to sink. And it is often observable that the older a man gets, the more difficult it is to him to retain a believing conception of his own death. This influence of habit was necessarily strong in a man whose life was so monotonous as Marner's, who saw no new people and heard of no new events to keep alive in him the idea of the unexpected and the changeful. And it explained simply enough why his mind could be at ease, though he had left his house and his treasure more defenceless than usual. Silas was thinking with double complacency of his supper first because it would be hot and savoury and secondly because it would cost him nothing for the little bit of pork was a present from that excellent housewife miss priscilla lammeter to whom he had this day carried a handsome piece of linen and it was only on occasion of a present like this that silas indulged himself with roast meat supper was his favourite meal because it came at his time of revelry when his heart warmed over his gold Whenever he had roast meat, he always chose to have it for supper. But this evening he had no sooner ingeniously knotted his string fast round his bit of pork, twisted the string according to rule over his door-key, passed it through the handle, and made it fast on the hanger, than he remembered that a piece of very fine twine was indispensable to his setting up a new piece of work in his loom early in the morning. It had slipped his memory because in coming from Mr. Lammeter's he had not had to pass through the village. But to lose time by going on errands in the morning was out of the question. It was a nasty fog to turn out into, but there were things Silas loved better than his own comfort. So, drawing his pork to the extremity of the hanger, and arming himself with his lantern and his old sack, he set out on what, in ordinary weather, would have been a twenty minutes' errand. He could not have locked his door without undoing his well-knotted string and retarding his supper. It was not worth his while to make that sacrifice. What thief would find his way to the stone pits on such a night as this? And why should he come on this particular night, when he had never come through all the fifteen years before? These questions were not distinctly present in Silas's mind. They merely served to represent the vaguely felt foundation of his freedom from anxiety. He reached his door in much satisfaction that his errand was done. He opened it, and to his short-sighted eyes everything remained as he had left it, except that the fire sent out a welcome increase of heat. He trod about the floor while putting by his lantern and throwing aside his hat and sack, so as to merge the marks of Dunstan's feet on the sand in the marks of his own nailed boots. Then he moved his pork nearer the fire, and sat down to the agreeable business of tending the meat, and warming himself at the same time. Anyone who had looked at him as the red light shone upon his pale face, strange, straining eyes, and meagre form, would perhaps have understood the mixture of contemptuous pity, dread, and suspicion with which he was regarded by his neighbours in Raveloe yet few men could be more harmless than poor Marner. In his truthful, simple soul, not even the growing greed and worship of gold could beget any vice directly injurious to others. The light of his faith quite put out, and his affections made desolate, he had clung with all the force of his nature to his work and his money, and like all objects to which a man devotes himself, they had fashioned him into correspondence with themselves. 
his loom as he wrought in it without ceasing had in its turn wrought on him and confirmed more and more the monotonous craving for its monotonous response his gold as he hung over it and saw it grow gathered his power of loving together into a hard isolation like its own as soon as he was warm he began to think it would be a long while to wait till after supper before he drew out his guineas and it would be pleasant to see them on the table before him as he ate his unwonted feast for joy is the best of wine and silas's guineas were a golden wine of that sort he rose and placed his candle unsuspectingly on the floor near his loom swept away the sand without noticing any change and removed the bricks the sight of the empty hole made his heart leap violently but the belief that his gold was gone could not come at once only terror and the eager effort to put an end to the terror he passed his trembling hand all about the hole trying to think it possible that his eyes had deceived him then he held the candle in the hole and examined it curiously trembling more and more at last he shook so violently that he let fall the candle and lifted his hands to his head trying to steady himself that he might think had he put his gold somewhere else by a sudden resolution last night and then forgotten it a man falling into dark waters seeks a momentary footing even on sliding stones and silas by acting as if he believed in false hopes warded off the moment of despair he searched in every corner he turned his bed over and shook it and kneaded it he looked in his brick oven where he laid his sticks when there was no other place to be searched he kneeled down again and felt once more all round the hole there was no untried refuge left for a moment's shelter from the terrible truth yes there was a sort of refuge which always comes with the prostration of thought under an overpowering passion it was that expectation of impossibilities the belief in contradictory images which is still distinct from madness because it is capable of being dissipated by the external fact silas got up from his knees trembling and looked round at the table didn't the gold lie there after all the table was bare then he turned and looked behind him looked all round his dwelling seeming to strain his brown eyes after some possible appearance of the bags where he had already sought them in vain he could see every object in his cottage and his gold was not there again he put his trembling hands to his head and gave a wild ringing scream the cry of desolation for a few moments after he stood motionless but the cry had relieved him from the first maddening pressure of the truth he turned and tottered towards his loom and got into the seat where he worked instinctively seeking this as the strongest assurance of reality and now that all the false hopes had vanished and the first shock of certainty was past the idea of a thief began to present itself and he entertained it eagerly because a thief might be caught and made to restore the gold the thought brought some new strength with it and he started from his loom to the door as he opened it the rain beat in upon him for it was falling more and more heavily there were no footsteps to be tracked on such a night footsteps when had the thief come during silas's absence in the daytime the door had been locked and there had been no marks of any inroad on his return by daylight and in the evening too he said to himself everything was the same as when he had left it the sand and bricks looked as if they had not been moved was it a thief who had taken the bags or was it a cruel power that no hands could reach which had delighted in making him a second time desolate he shrank from this vaguer dread and fixed his mind with struggling effort on the robber with hands who could be reached by hands his thoughts glanced at all the neighbours who had made any remarks or asked any questions which he might now regard as a ground of suspicion there was jem rodney a known poacher and otherwise disreputable he had often met marner in his journeys across the fields and had said something jestingly about the weaver's money nay 
he had once irritated Marner by lingering at the fire when he had called to light his pipe, instead of going about his business. Jem Rodney was the man. There was ease in the thought. Jem could be found and made to restore the money. Marner did not wish to punish him, but only to get back his gold which had gone from him, and left his soul like a forlorn traveller on an unknown desert. The robber must be laid hold of. Marner's ideas of legal authority were confused, but he felt that he must go and proclaim his loss. And the great people in the village, the clergyman, the constable, and Squire Cass, would make Jem Rodney, or somebody else, deliver up the stolen money. He rushed out in the rain under the stimulus of this hope, forgetting to cover his head, not caring to fasten his door, for he felt as if he had nothing left to lose. He ran swiftly till want of breath compelled him to slacken his pace as he was entering the village at the turning close to the rainbow. The rainbow, in Marner's view, was a place of luxurious resort for rich and stout husbands, whose wives had superfluous stores of linen. It was the place where he was likely to find the powers and dignities of Raveloe, and where he could most speedily make his loss public. He lifted the latch, and turned into the bright bar or kitchen on the right hand, where the less lofty customers of the house were in the habit of assembling the parlour on the left being reserved for the more select society in which squire cass frequently enjoyed the double pleasure of conviviality and condescension but the parlour was dark to-night the chief personages who ornamented its circle being all at mrs osgood's birthday dance as godfrey cass was and in consequence of this the party on the high screen seats in the kitchen was more numerous than usual Several personages, who would otherwise have been admitted into the parlour and enlarged the opportunity of hectoring and condescension for their betters, being content this evening to vary their enjoyment by taking their spirits and water where they themselves could hector and condescend in company that called for beer. End of chapter 5